Awesome. Uh, I do hope that you guys will stick around uh, so that we can get a chance to build community with you, get a chance to get to know you uh, and connect with you. Uh, and the reason why is because, honestly, this series, it, like Allison mentioned, we're starting today, I'm really excited about because it's called A Story to Tell. And the tagline behind that is that there is power in sharing. And I think it's important that we understand that we all have a story to tell, that life is actually made up of a collection of stories. Some people may say box of chocolates, but I would like to think it's stories because it's unique to who we are as individuals. Each of us have these stories that are made up of twists and turns, laughter and joy, you know, great moments, but also moments of sorrow. And through these different things that take place within our life, They help define who we are. And so what we want to do is during this series, we want to dive into the incredible stories that are found within the pages of the Bible. And as we look at the stories of different men and women and how God intervened in their life, what we will begin to see is that the tried and true wisdom and truths that took place in their life through these pages that we read are wisdom and truths that we can continue to apply in our life. And what we'll recognize is what God did then, he will continue to do today. Hebrews tells us, and Allison alluded to it last week, that sometimes people think that the Spirit of God, God's moving when it comes to prayer and how God moves upon miracles and in our lives has ceased But we believe what Hebrew says, that he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so the truth that resonated back then will be the truth that resonates today. And through it all, we'll see the greater story that's woven through the pages of Scripture will be woven into our life as well. And we'll see his goodness. We'll see his promise. We'll see his courage We'll also see his encouragement as it is lived out through the story that is laid before us. And so as we look at stories of faith and courage and redemption and transformation, we'll see how it intersects with our our own narratives and remind us that our lives are filled with purpose. Beyond maybe what some of us may imagine even in our current circumstance and situation. Because here's what I know to be true, that God's redemptive work has done some incredible things in the lives of our community right here. That some of you have experienced God's goodness and grace where at one point in life, you weren't heading in the right direction. But because of what God has done, has, what he has restored, and what he is doing, your life has ultimately changed and been redeemed for his good name, and for his good works. Revelations tells us in chapter 12 and verse 11, it says that they triumphed over him. This is John writing to the church in the last days. And it says they triumphed over him, meaning Satan, by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. The stories that we have and that we have the ability to share, they do matter. And this series is going to be about Jesus and what he has done in our lives. And the important thing that we need to understand is that we all have a story to tell. If we have been redeemed in Christ, you have a story to tell. And sometimes we feel like, well, our story might not mean much, or I don't feel like it. It's got this big redemptive, you know, story. Well, if you were living one way and you accepted Christ, We have to realize that our life has totally changed and there is a new future in that. And that is a story to share. And I want to just give just real quickly just a few reasons why it's important that we share our story. Number one, it gives glory to God. When we share our story, when we talk about it, it gives glory to what God has done within our life. 1 Corinthians tells us this, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. And when we proclaim what he's done in our life, it gives glory to what God has done and will continue to do in and through you. 
Another reason why it's important that we share our story is that it grows, our, our faith grows in God and in his word. It grows our faith when we share stories of transformation, of redemption, of healing, of, of recovery, of addiction. It, it changes and it grows who we are in our life. Romans tells us that faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. So when we proclaim what God has done, it grows our faith. It also grows the faith of others. When we hear it, all of a sudden we're encouraged that we know that God can do something, that God still does move. And so when we tell our story, people can be encouraged through it. Also, when we share our story, it gives other believers the courage to share their story. It reminds them that, hey, I've got a story to share. I've got a story to tell that can maybe help someone, that could, that could remind them that God loves them, that God sees them, that God has a purpose with them. And then when we share, it encourages them to say, you know what, this needs to be told because there's lives that need to be changed through the story of what God has done within my life. Another reason why we tell these stories is it keeps us accountable. When we talk about what he's done, it keeps us accountable to living the way that we're proclaiming that what God has done in our life is true and that we are redeemed and that we are changed through what he has done within our life. Again, it also reveals the power of God. It reveals his power within your life of what he has done. And lastly, the reason why we need to tell our stories, it dispels the darkness of the enemy, because this is a spiritual warfare. But yet when we proclaim and we share what God is doing, it pushes back the enemy. Again, Revelation says we overcome by the blood of the lamb, but also by the word of what we share in our testimony. We all have a story to tell, and that's why there is power in sharing. And if you are a children of God, you've got a story, and it's powerful. Because we were all headed for death at one point, spiritually. But because of his redemptive power, we live again. And we know where our eternity is found. And it is secure because of what God has done. And so in this series, over the next few weeks, we're actually breaking it off into two portions. The first couple of weeks, we're going to be talking about this underlying theme that you see from Genesis to Revelation. And it's this, but God. And then the last two weeks, we're going to look at this phrase that's found in Timothy. And it says, but you. And through these stories, as we see, and we'll line out some of them here today throughout God's word, it's going to be more than just talking about what God did here. But there are some of you that we have asked that are actually going to take some time to share their written story and the narrative that God is doing right now. Now. So not only is it as of old that we see how God moved, but we also see it in the present, how God is moving. And we believe that it will encourage people's spirit to say, you know what? He is the same God that was yesterday, today. And we know that if our dreams or our plans or, or what we're believing for has not come to fruition yet, we know that the story is not over and that there's hope that we can cling to. So real quick, let's dive into this idea of but God. You know, it's probably the most two powerful words that you could find in scripture, but God. You know, I'm, I'm no English major. That wasn't my, uh, you know, it wasn't my first language. I'm Samoan. Now, some of you guys are shocked that I just said that because I don't think I've declared that very often. Some of you guys, I, you're not Samoan. Uh, I'm Samoan, and so English is not my first language, uh, but I don't speak Samoan either. So I don't even know what my first language is. <laughs> but in all honesty, English was not my favorite subject in uh, school. But I do know that word but is a conjunction word. And what it does is it ties like two clauses and and sentences together. And I know there's different conjunction words like and, if, nor, or. But that conjunction word of but is it's a pretty impactful one. Because when you use that in a sentence, when it brings things together, what happens is it ultimately sometimes, most often negates what was previously stated. Like if I say the phrase, like, uh, man, they're a really good person, but... 
Like all of a sudden now, you don't really have the confidence in full, complete trustworthy because of that word, but. Am I right? Or, or maybe if you look at this one, like, I like that idea, but let's be real. We're not going with that idea. Like because of that word, but, you're like, there's no confidence I have in that word, but. And oftentimes what happens is that we try to, you know, be tactful in our conversations and our response. And so we usually offer some sort of encouragement first. Like, I, I really like you, but I just don't think this is going to work out. Like, what do you focus on? We don't ever focus on the I really like you part. Yeah, I'm really like, no. What happens is you focus on the after. What came after the conjunction word, a but. And so you, you focus on the, this isn't going to work out. And your life has totally changed. And but here's the thing that I've referenced and we see here in God's word. What is predicated in these stories when there is a but God ultimately changes. That but there changes the direction. I was going one way. I was doing one thing. I was hopeless. I was just full of despair and depression and anxiety, and I was tormented. But God, now all of a sudden, that changes the narrative of everything that was going on, and to the left of the but God was heartache and pain, but to the right of the but God, there is hope, there is future, there is life, and there is light. Over 45 times throughout Genesis through Revelation, there's a reference to a but God. And I think that gives us hope to know that within our story, we could have been heading one way, but God did something in you and through your life, and now your life is totally changed. Is there anyone here today that would attest that God did something in your life, that there was a but God moment where your life was heading for torment, your life was headed for ruin? But by the grace of God, your life has changed and it has been renewed. And yet he redeems not only you, but honestly, he wants to redeem your story as well. That your story can be used for his glory. That your story can help Open people's eyes to understand that their story does not have to be over. That there is hope. There can be a future. There can be peace that can come into someone's life. Despite the hard and difficult things of life, they know that there is a firm foundation that they can place their feet upon. Every time we see this but God it's good news. It's course correction in our lives. To the left, it appeared as some of the worst situations, whether it be characterized by rebellion, whether it be disobedience, or things just beyond our control. But to the right of it, there is a hope. And that hope is found in Jesus. And he wants to redeem our stories, not again just for him, but so that it can be used to bring glory to his name, to encourage others that could use some encouragement. What we've realized that even in ministry over the last couple decades, Alice and I have been in, man, life's hard. And I don't think you have to be in ministry to know that, man, life is hard. There are challenging things that you will encounter in this life. And these stories of not only what happen within the narrative of the pages of the Bible can give hope. But your story of coming through whatever you went through can also be a place that encourages people to hold on to hope. Because everything in life will tell you to give up, throw in the tail, it's not worth it. There's no need to put your faith in Jesus. But we're here to tell you that your story does matter and it makes a difference. The but God moments change what was written previously to what will be written afterwards. You know, just, just a couple references within the Bible. Genesis chapter 20, verse 3. It's the story of Abraham and Sarah. They're coming into a nation. 
and it was King Abimelech there. And he tells Sarah, he goes, Sarah, don't, don't tell him that you're my wife because what they're going to do is they're going to kill me. Tell him you're my sister. And so what happens is so he's trying to save his own life, you know, and their family. So what he tells him is like, hey, hey, what's going to happen is this is going to happen. So then Abimelech's like, oh, that's your sister? Well, I want you to be a part of my harem. And this is what it says in, in Genesis chapter 20 and verse 3. Abimelech had taken Sarah into his harem, but God protected her from him. That but God brought in a protection over Sarah and Abraham and that family. There are but God moments that will bring protection into your life. Where it was heading one way, but God will protect, he will provide, he'll bring exactly what is needed in the moment. You know, many of us are familiar maybe with one of the most uh, but God moments in Genesis chapter 50 and verse 20 in Joseph's story. And we'll probably dive into that over the, in the next few weeks. But you see Joseph's story, and he faced setback after setback, even though he was integrous, and he was doing everything that he knew that he was to do. And so at the end of his life, his brothers are there. And Genesis chapter 50 and verse 20 says, the brothers intended evil against Joseph, but God purposed it for good. There are many of us that that verse could be very true of our life. Man, you've walked through some challenging things and difficult things. But now that you've gone through it and you're on the other side of it, you know that there's been a but God moment that he will use this, what the enemy intended for evil, to take you out, to destroy you, to get you to give up. He's using it for his good. And that's what can begin to happen. And it's all throughout scripture that we begin to see this. Romans 5.8. We were trapped in sin, but God expressed his love by sending Christ to die for the ungodly. That's the gospel summed up in one verse. We were all dead to sin, but God, through his gracious mercy, sent his son to pay the price that we all should have paid. We've all experienced a but God moment that changed our life from death to life. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, temptations seem unbearable, but God always provides an escape so that we can endure. 1 Thessalonians 4, 14, when Christians die, we grieve. I know people in here have experienced loss in your life, loss of a loved one, loss of, some of you are grieving. But this promise says here, when Christians die, we grieve, but God promises if they are found new in Christ to resurrect them through Christ so even in the midst of our pain there's hope that God continues to give us these two words have an impactful ability to change the narrative of our story and like I mentioned the series though is not just about the stories in the Bible but it's also about the stories that are being written right here in our midst. Today, we want to talk about a couple gentlemen that are overcomers, that have overcome some difficult situations in their life. These gentlemen have overcome addictions that plague their life for quite some time. And this is the verse I think we stand upon when we look at this idea of what they're proclaiming, it's 2 Timothy 4.17. It says, but the Lord, but God, stood with me, strengthened me, so that the proclamation might be fully made through all the Gentiles, so that all the Gentiles may hear. Today, I've got a couple gentlemen that are going to stand here and proclaim their but God moments and how it revolutionized and changed their life for his glory and for his goodness. So they've got a story to tell. So if you guys will help me welcome Sean Chavez and Nathan Archibald to the stage. You're trying to figure out who gets the middle seat, the hot seat. Well, thank you guys so much for um, taking time to share your story with all of us. Um, I'm going to start with Nathan because we go back uh, a little bit further. Um, over 
12, 13 years ago, uh, we met, Allison and I were youth and children's pastors at the church that your family had attended. Um, You were a teenager at that time, but we didn't really quite have much interaction because um, those were some dark days for you. And so would you just kind of let the church know, our church family, just kind of share what those days really looked like for you uh, when it came to addiction and the things that you were wrestling with at the time. Absolutely. Morning, church. I'll try to hold it together. I'm, I'm so thankful for the redeeming blood of Jesus in my life. During those times, as you mentioned, were very dark days for me. Um, from all my adolescent years, I just, it's all a fog because I was addicted to something. Um, from grade six, becoming uh, first smoking weed, to grade uh, nine, using meth and heroin, uh, completely dominated and took over my life. So very dealing with crippling depression, hopelessness, and despair. Uh, all these things were just dominating my life. And as the Bible declares, you become a slave to wherever you choose to obey. And I was obeying uh, this addiction in my life. So very, very dark and uh, terrible days for me. Uh, I was blessed to have an incredible family, a loving mom, a loving sister, and a loving dad. Uh, but I didn't have Jesus in my life. Uh, and he made the difference, and he makes the difference. And I didn't have him. Uh, at that time, because I was running from him. I was repressing the truth in, in, in unrighteousness, as the Bible said. And I was running to everything under the sun to, to fill this void uh, of pain, of hurt, uh, of misery. And I was trying everything other than Jesus. Sean, um, we got a chance to know each other just a, a few years ago. Uh, our kids played basketball at a community center. And I was told by my kids that I needed to coach them, uh, and Sean happens to run the community center, and um, he called me in to do a background check. Uh, sometimes you have to look out for those pastors, uh, and so <laughs> he's fingerprinting me, and he's looking at my, my card, and he says, oh, you're a pastor at Dream City Church, or this is a church that we were previously at, and he goes, I go there, and so that kind of struck up the conversation of, of where that led and knew that you were a, a believer, and we had that connection, and then uh, over the years, our kids just kept playing at the same community center, so we've built this relationship, but um, why, why don't you tell us a little bit of your, your backstory and how you got to a point where uh, addiction really was the, the vice within your life that it was hard to overcome at one point? Hey, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you and Allison for letting me come up here and speak today and share. You know, I really hope, you know, this reaches somebody. Um, at, you know, I grew up in a nice house, a good neighborhood. You know, I had more than I, you know, ever needed. Lots of friends, played sports, good grades, you know, a great family, you know, awesome family, you know, still to this day. Um, at a very young age, you know, I started experimenting with, you know, various controlled substances, um, recreationally, you know, just as a teenager, you know, with your friends, weekends, at parties, and, you know, we all, we all pick a favorite one, and my drug of choice became alcohol. Um, that's the one that really did it for me. Um, I don't know why, it, it just did. It, we, we all pick one. Um, I'd say, you know, after high school, during my college years, that's when it really peaked and started taking over. Um, It's a really, it's a progressive condition, you know, meaning that it it never gets better. It always gets worse um, when you have that condition, you know, like we do. And, you know, so as it progressed, you know, everything was affected negatively. School, you know, my dating relationships, work, Um, going out, you know, we were going out every night with our friends, drinking, partying, hanging out with the wrong crowd, you know, doing all the stuff that we shouldn't be doing, and, you know, it eventually catches up with you, and that's kind of what happened. Can you share, you guys just shared, like, the turning point, like, when you knew that addiction really had was taking a toll on you, your life, like, what was, like, almost that rock-bottom moment where you felt like, I need to get some help, and what did that look like? Absolutely. So I I knew addiction was becoming a problem when it became something I needed, no longer something I wanted. Um, And the drugs began to make the choices for me. And I was so in bondage to sin uh, that I was stealing, I was breaking into cars. My first charge was stealing a purse from a lady in the shopping mall. And and these are things that I never would have thought myself to ever become in my life. I never would have imagined myself to sink that low. 
And I'm reminded of a quote that says, sin will take you farther than you want to go, keep you longer than you want to stay, and cost you more than you're willing to pay. Uh, drugs did that to me. Uh, they really did. They, they took me to a place where I never thought I would go. They kept me there longer, absolutely, than I wanted to stay, and they cost me more uh, than anything I could imagine that, that I would pay. Um, and, and I know the, the turning point, of that, that last moment where I knew I really needed help, was my family was so loving and kind to let me, you know, kind of try to get off heroin. And when you're addicted to heroin and you're withdrawing, uh, the physical effect is miserable. It is insane. It's just that you are just so crippled by the addiction that, it, that the physical need, I mean, your legs don't even work. You can't really even move. Uh, it's incredible. My family was trying to host me and help me through that process. And unfortunately, it was Mother's Day. My mom got gifts for Mother's Day. And then just this addiction, I mean, so enslaved to it. That, that I got what she got from Mother's Day and went and pawned it and went and got drugs. Uh, and I, I was so ashamed of that and, and still obviously very ashamed of those things. Thank you for the cross that um, sin has been covered and paid for and my conscience is clear. But, but I was, the, the, the feeling of gr guilt that I experienced uh, brought me to my knees and, and just uh, desire for change. And I, I text my mom, I was like, I need help. That's all I said. <laughs> and it was very evident to the world other than me up until that point. Um, that I needed some help desperately, and I, I sent that message to my mom, and uh, obviously got in connection with you and Allison, and if one for you guys and my mom, and obviously Jesus, I, I wouldn't have made it to Teen Challenge and get involved in that. So, talk more about that in a second. Yeah. No, it's, it's incredible, just kind of that. Yeah. That that quote. Say that quote again that you referenced to sin, because I think right. that's that's a powerful thought for all of us to to, to remember and hold on to. Yeah. I barely did it the first time, so we'll see it a second time. Um, sin will take you further than, than you want to go, keep you longer than you want to stay, and cost you more than you're willing to pay. Yeah. Addiction, sin, all together, the exactly. same thing. Yeah, so good. Sean, what did that look like for you when you got to that rock bottom point when you needed um, help? Well, like, you know, like Nate said over here, it, you know, it, it takes you over. It becomes the number one priority. Um, the first thing you do, you know, when you get off work is you, you know, drive straight to the liquor store, you know, cause I needed my fix. I needed my medicine. Um, my parents eventually, you know, threw me out of the house. You know, they just, they couldn't deal with it anymore. Uh, so I moved in, you know, with my friends that were doing the same thing. And that was, you know, probably a mistake. You know, it was a mistake. So, you know, not too long after that, um, you know, I started losing a lot of my friends um, to the effects of it. Um, overdoses, suicides, um, two of my best friends, you know, that I ever had. Uh, they're not here with us anymore, they're dead. You know, and at that point, I kind of just realized, you know, I didn't want to end up like that. And I knew it was just a matter of time or I was gonna either end up dead or in jail. So I had to make a decision. So as you made that decision, what, can you just share with us, what were some of those things then? What did that look like, that recovery process for you guys is knowing you reached out for help, you know, you knew you're losing people all around you and this is not the path that you wanted to end on. So what was kind of your transformation story where it was this but God moment within your life? Hello. There you go. <laughs> Never mind. Um, yeah, so it started with, you know, I was so blessed to my family to be going to a church that was well connected with Teen Challenge. Uh, so I, I knew the solution was there the whole time, and obviously being Christ through the program, but I checked into Teen Challenge, and, and the process was really painful. Uh, to overcome your addiction is an incredibly challenging thing, as Sean knows, as many of us probably do as well, um, that it takes the grace of God and it takes a loving community in order for that to take place. Uh, if it wasn't for uh, genuine connections and those real life, authentic relationships, I would not have overcome my addiction. Uh, and being discipled in God's word, you know, renewing my mind and changing the way I was thinking and identifying the purpose behind my behavior uh, was hurt, was pain, was insecurity, was this longing desire to fit in on this deep sense of rejection that I was experiencing. All those needs were met when I encountered Jesus. Uh, every single one of those needs were met, and, I, and I'm, I'm so grateful a 14 challenge, I'll forever be indebted teen challenge that you are in and Allison for all you guys' help along the way, my family, of course. Um, but it, it began, it was an incredibly hard process. I withdrawed off heroin. I didn't sleep for about a week and a half. Um, 
and just a loving community came alongside me to support me, and that was incredible. I know the first thing my mom did when she visited me uh, was that she lifted up the back of my shirt to see if she could still see my ribs from my back uh, because I was just so unhealthy physically. Um, and, and then just to see God change my life, I know it was an incredible blessing to my family, increasing their faith as well. Uh, so it was a process, it was a hard process, but it took God, it took his word, and it took his people uh, in order to get me uh, to that point. Now, I know we kind of share the same physique, um, you know. Yes. yes. <laughs> hey, it hurts me that you laugh. <laughs> so you're a little but bigger we, than me. Yeah, but when you, when you went into Teen Challenge, about how much did you weigh? Because I remember, like, like, when I say, when I've seen you over the years, I'm like, wow, like, I never, the only Nathan that I met was that one that I met at Desert Ridge. We sat across each other at a Rubio's, and, and like, you were probably, what, like, 100 and... Nine, ten, twelve pounds at that point. At your worst, I probably looked like that. Probably about one hundred and forty. <laughs> yeah. Um, but you know, I'm, I'm six one two. Yeah. You know, so that I was incredibly thin. Um, yeah. So yeah. this looking is terrible. And not only the spiritual transformation has taken place, but the physical as well. It's incredible. Sean, what about you? As we've we've rushed into that. Well, I'm going to maybe jump jump ahead to that. But why don't you um, just kind of share with us? what God has done in your life now? What does is, what is that redemptive power look like? From the Sean that was addicted, was, was an alcoholic, that knew he needed change, reached out for help, God was doing some incredible things in your life. What does Sean today look like? Well, uh, pre-saved Sean was a bad guy. <laughs> um, you know, first, you know, I'd like to say I'd give all the credit to God. You know, he, he has it all. Um, you know, the main thing to do now, I think, is outreach, um, education, um, just talking to people. You know, I, I use a lot of different resources uh, to get sober. Um, AA, Celebrate Recovery. Um, you know, I have a connection now over at the Dream Center. So, you know, as Arian said, I work at a park. So I think God has placed me there. Um, so I can walk around, you know, with all the homelessness going on and all the fentanyl and all that stuff going around. Um, I walk around the park and I evangelize. I talk to them and I try to, you know, let them know that there's, you know, there's a place for them. You know, there's several places for them. Um, you know, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. You know, I try not to be too pushy. I try to get, build that connection with them first, you know, and then let them know, hey, you know, I work in that building over there. You know, let me know. Uh, come on in and talk to me. You know, we can, you know, I can, I can get you into a rehab location. I can get you a room at the Dream Center. You know, anything that would help, you know, try to help you out, basically. How many years sobriety for you? Uh, by the grace of God, 15. Come on, 15 years. <laughs> From a life that could have ended but experienced that he knew he needed help and restoration. 15 years later, sober. And I've seen him evangelize. Like, it's a rough part. Like, this community center, and, like, he'll mention, he's like, I, I walked in a couple of weeks ago when we were playing basketball. He's like, well, there was another one that was here that was strung out laying at the doors, and I had to, like, people, he had to step over him to help kind of open the door. But he said, I, I was reaching out to him, trying to get him the help that he need. Because he goes, the days are short. And I know that God has put on my heart that I've got to do all that I can to reach people. And I've, been only, I've only seen just great things from Sean and his heart to evangelize and reach people that were at a place of hopelessness to try to give them hope. And so, Sean, it was incredible, just incredible. I'm just thankful for you and sharing your story. Nathan, tell us, tell us it's, it's been a while so, since you were at that place where you're at. What's God doing in and through you? What has he done? What does life look like right now? Absolutely. So I went to Teen Challenge 2013. Uh, I encountered Living Christ week after the program. I went in the chapel uh, depressed, suicidal. I left the chapel, born again Christian, uh, Christ follower. I realized I didn't come to Teen Challenge seeking a relationship with God. I came to Teen Challenge because God was seeking a relationship with me, uh, and he set me free, delivered me, and he put a purpose in my heart uh, to serve and to love uh, others and to inspire hope in the lives of others so I went through the process of Teen Challenge. I completed the program. 
became an intern, worked various positions there, and now I'm the supervisor, uh, and I'm able to lead, I'm able to lay down my life, I'm able to uh, minister and be an example and ultimately point people to the cross because it really is all about the gospel of Jesus Christ, and that is what saved me, and that's what saves other people. So I'm able to, as a good shepherd does, to lay down his life uh, for others and minister, be an example, and help other people come off their addiction. And Teen Challenge, that's what it is, is a faith-based solution to the drug and alcohol et epidemic and any life-controlling issue. Uh, we just love them. Uh, we, we point them to the Word. We point them to the cross, and we disciple them. It's an intense ministry, uh, and Sean understands so the nature of what he deals with is similar to what we deal with, um, but the results are incredible. Seeing lives changed and encounter God and their lives being set free and delivered, there's really nothing greater than that. Uh, that's what life's all about, so it's, that's what I'm doing today, uh, becoming uh, credentials as pastor here really soon. Uh, and I'm just thankful that I can, I can proclaim the excellencies of the one who's called me out of the darkness into his marvelous light, and that's all I do. Come on. Can we just put our hands together for these gentlemen? Incredible stories. They truly have a story to tell of what God did in their life. And just knowing Nathan's story you know, firsthand and seeing him in leadership at Teen Challenge. You've probably seen hundreds of guys come through that program. Some, some don't make it, but you've been there to help them through it, to, to give them the resources, the options, to pray, to believe with them. And then there's hundreds that have made it that have ultimately changed the life because of the encourage, the support, the support, but ultimately because of the testimony that you're living out of what God has done in your life. Um, man, we're so incredibly proud of both of you guys, and thank you. I know it's never easy just getting up and just sharing your story, but that's something that you felt like God has put on your heart that people need to know because there is power in sharing. And so one more time, church, can we just let these guys know how much we love them? We're thankful for them. Thank you. You know, it, these are incredible stories. You guys can be seated. We're not gonna, well, we're not going to be too much longer. I'm going <laughs> to. But, you know, there's some of you in here that you've heard stories. And, and like I said, it's encouraged your faith to be like, man, I've got a story to tell. And God's done a great redemptive work within my life. But maybe there's some of you in here that you haven't overcome yet, whatever that vice might be in your life, whether it be a substance, alcohol, whether it be, you know, drugs, whether it be pornography, whatever it be, just whatever it is that has held you back. Today, there's stories of hope, of but God moments where their life was going in one direction towards destruction. But yet, this conjunction word of the word but changes everything so that you can live out the purpose that ultimately he set before you to live out. And we would want to pray for you. There's some of you that could use some prayer that says, man, and I'm going to ask these guys along with our prayer team here in a minute just to stand up here and if there's someone in here that says, man, I just, I need help. Because really, that's where it starts, is admitting that I need help. We have some incredible resources to be able to help supply you with. And if there are any of you out here that says, man, Arian, I just, I just need some help. Um, we have an email address that will go up on the screen, and you can email us, and, and, and Allison and I will reach out, and we'll supply you with different resources. Sean, as he mentioned, you know, with AA or Celebrate Recovery. I know with Nathan, with Teen Challenge, there's different resources and ministries that we partner with that can bring help. There may be some of you in here that you would actually like some prayer because maybe you know someone. You know someone that is heavily addicted and is being overcome by these things. And maybe you want to pray that they would be overcomers. And so we would love with our prayer team just to couple our faith along with yours to believe for breakthrough. Believe for that to take place within their life. Just like Nathan mentioned and even Sean, they had good families. Families that were praying for them to experience their breakthrough. We want to come alongside you. Because we know sometimes it can be weary and just like, ah, oh, I just don't know if they'll ever get through. I don't know if they'll ever. We want to stand with you. 
We want to agree with you that we believe that the breakthrough can happen, that the story is not over, and that we serve a God that hears our prayers, and that we believe that he can and will intervene in their situation. And so we want to pray with you for that as well. And so I'm going to just have us all stand to our feet, and as we get ready to pray, and again, the reminder is, but God can do some incredible things. We were going left. It was difficult, but the grace of God is powerful, merciful, good, loving, and kind. Some of you in here, you've just been overcome with just life's difficulties. And maybe there isn't a full-blown addiction, but maybe there's just a, a hardness of just really leaning in to what God can do in your life. And so as I pray, I'm going to have our prayer team come forward and we want to pray for you and we want to believe for you. Next week, we're going to be talking about marriages and we have some incredible stories to tell when it pertains to marriages because we understand a marriages, marriages are under attack right now. And so we want to share some incredible stories of but God moments where things look this way before the but God moment, but after the but God moment, man, God is doing incredible things and it can be true of your marriage as well. And over the next few weeks, we're going to be talking about people that are standing in it. Maybe the, maybe the dream, the promise, the healing, the, it hasn't come to fruition yet. But it doesn't mean that we give up. And we have some incredible stories of people hanging in there, knowing that God is good. And so as I pray, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have those that maybe you just need prayer. It's whatever it is, we're going to have you come up and we'd love for you to pray with our prayer team members. Uh, but we really believe that God can move in our hearts. So dear Heavenly Father, God, I thank you. I thank you for today. I thank you for the boldness of these men that shared their stories. And so God, even right now as I pray, God, I pray that if people feel impressed on their heart, they need prayer. They need someone to couple their faith with theirs to believe for maybe a brother, a sister, a sibling, a dad, a mom, whatever it may be, God. I pray that we would stand in boldness and know, God, that our story is not over. So God, I thank you for what you can do. I thank you ultimately for who you are. I thank you that we do all have but God moments, but if there's anyone in here that maybe hasn't completely surrendered their life, God, I pray that they would let one of these prayer team members know because that is the ultimate but God moment within our life. That once we were sinners, but by your grace and mercy, we were made alive. And I thank you, God. I thank you for who you are, and I thank you for your goodness, in Jesus' name. So if you're here today, I'd love for you guys, if you, if you need prayer, feel free to come and talk with our prayer team members up here. We're going to pray with you. We're going to believe for you. And then just in a moment, we're going to dismiss you guys. We have our luncheon today. We would love for you guys to stick around. And so what will happen is you guys go behind the curtain. We're going to pray up here. And then we're going to prep this area. And then we're going to come back and let's meet some people. Let's, let's find out our stories. Let's just let's get to know people and let's build community together. So you're welcome to come up here. Let's get some prayer for those that would love it. And then if you're not, we're going to head over there and then we'll prep and get ready just to be together as a church family. We love you, church. Thank you for being here. We'll see you guys here in just a few minutes.